Commissioner Kennedy? Commissioner Duckham? Commissioner Tompkins? Here. Commissioner Mahoney? Present. Commissioner Williams? Present. Commissioner Elwell? Here. Chairman Shotwell? Here. Seven present. This is your opportunity for public comment. The guidelines are each individual will state their name and have three minutes to address the board. You may only address the board. The board wants under public comment. The opportunity may not be yielded your time to others, and the board members will not debate nor answer questions at this time. Public comment. Peter Bournemouth, I'd like to address for a moment the chairman, um, the Stephen Rand situation with our sheriff. As you all know, the county submitted a letter asking for his resignation based on the statements that he'd made um, that were documented in a civil case. And um, the attorney general reviewed that letter and made two findings. The first was that the county had failed the procedural requirement of the statute that neither an affidavit nor a certificate of service were found in the submission. But she went on generously to rule on the issue anyway, and she ruled that misconduct was not, did not occur because there were only offensive statements but no actions. Uh, I'd like to comment that Chairman Shotwell told me that he had legal counsel when drafting that letter. For a lawyer not to know the requirements of a statute is a serious issue. And I do not know who that lawyer was, so I have no personal bias or reason to target them. But I believe that that attorney should not get any more legal work from the county because they failed to read the statute and they failed to properly advise Sherman Shotwell that an affidavit and a certificate of service were necessary. With regard to the issue itself, Sheriff Rand's resignation and the fact that he remains in office, I reviewed the Attorney General's legal opinion. I also looked at other federal case law regarding the government. And it's apparent that a government official can say whatever they want and that misconduct, for there to be misconduct, there either had to be some mistruth spoken or there had to be some action taken in accordance with the words that people found offensive. And the only thing that might have risen to that is the fact that there was an accidental discharge of a firearm. Um, but I don't know if that would rise to misconduct because what the county focused on was the language. So I want to say that all the county commissioners should check with Chairman Shotwell find out who that lawyer was, and that they should not get any more legal work from the county. Thank you. Any other public comment? Any other public comment? Public comment is now closed. Entertain a motion to approve the minutes. We have a motion in support. Any corrections? or additions. Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, duly carried. Administrator Overton. Up next we have uh, <coughs> our finance projections for 2020. We, uh, it's that time of year. We're working on putting together uh, expectations of revenue for next year. Cecilia, our finance director. Thank you, Mike. Um, so yes, yeah, so basically, um, our revenue can. Uh -huh. No. On the screen, I don't know. Our um, our revenue committee met about the middle of February, and we've been working on these projections for revenue um, since that time. We've had several um, um, 
meeting, uh, several phone calls, emails, meeting to try to come up with um, using analytic data to project our revenues. So basically, what's happened in the past, what we know today, and how can we project the future. Um, so on page three regarding our revenue, there's a pie that you know you're, everyone's familiar with, our revenue pie, and it's our breakdown. And it breaks down between our taxes and other charges, fees, fines, intergovernmental on a percentage basis. Um, so basically a good per, an, an idea of how much our revenue is is about $45 million. And it's breaking down by these percentages. Um, on the next page, uh, we talk about, we kind of take the different percentages and we kind of break down different line items that are in those slices of pie. All right. And one thing I want to I want to walk away with and you guys to to think about is that every single dollar that we budget for revenue is important because we know that that's the foundation of our budget. We know people are going to spend it. You know, they're going to they're going to meet their expenditure budget, so we definitely need to make our revenue budget. So it's very important that we are budgeting correctly with our revenues. So we keep that in mind. So even though there may be a small slice of the pie, it's still a part of the pie. So we need to um, make sure that we're we're going to you know question that, have support for that when we're budgeting these. So for example, with our taxes, it's 54 percent of 45 million. Of that, property taxes is 92 percent. So that's a huge chunk. So you're looking at $22 million of our budget is just taxes. These percentages don't change very much from year to year. It's pretty consistent. So, um, and then, uh, then if you go on to the next one, intergovernmental is another one. That's 17% of our budget. So you're looking at about $7.8 million. Yes? See, I was going to ask later on, but I'll ask it here on this slide because it's true also. So when you're looking at, for instance, taxes shows 54%. Uh -huh. That's of our total revenue, correct? Yes. And then the percentages you see below that are that percentage of the 54%. Yes. yes. And it gets more stretched out as you go down further where we're only showing about 77% on some of them. Is that because it's much smaller amounts on, on different items? Exactly, yeah. Okay. Exactly. Thank you. Exactly. That's exactly what this. It was done intentionally. We're, we're <laughs> anyways. It was done intentionally. We're trying to do just more high level. It was more to give you perspective of what we're looking at when we're looking at our budget and stuff. Any other questions before we move on? Yes. Yeah, could you explain a little bit further what the transfer ends are? The transfer ends are from other funds into the general fund. A lot of it, it's majority of it is uh, reimbursement for indirect cost. Um, we have a consultant called Maximus, and he create he c calculates an indirect cost rate, and it's more for like t um, to cover administrative services. Okay. So we charge funds that they pay back the general fund for that. There could be other things that the general fund has paid for that they're reimbursing for. Okay. It's also funds. Those those funds transfers in are from other revenue sources like grants, state grants. You know, health department half of it is funded through grants. Yeah. yeah. So what then? With with that being said, what's the difference between I'm looking at there's transfer in service transfer in at nine percent, and then there's other revenue by three percent. So what's the breakdown or the difference between the two? About six percent. No, I mean in terms of. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just playing. Just yeah, playing. yeah. The I'll leave it to Cecilia to explain it. Get really in there. I'm sorry. Which page are you looking at? Um, I'm looking at slide three. The breakdown. So okay. there's other revenue at 3%, yes. and then the transfer in at 9%. So if you could just kind of define, the, I guess, the the difference between the two, or the definition of the two, I guess. Because it almost sounds like they're the same. So if they're the same, I guess, why is Well, other revenue is more, it has your indirect cost reimbursement. That's where it's, um, so, let's see here. Um, The other, okay, so within there is indirect cost reimbursement, 33% of the other revenue. And then when you're talking about the transfer in, is probably what Mike was talking about, where grants are also paying us back. Or it could be other, other items that they're paying us back. Okay, so outside of the yeah, it's 9%. Outside. Okay. All right. there's, a, there's a definition on page 6. Okay. 
Thank you. Okay, yeah, no problem. All right, so on um, page seven, we the key indicators that the Revenue Committee looked at in order to be able to project our um, revenues for 2020, the primary were like foreclosures, um, property values, housing, inflation, deflation, new construction population. Those are, those are the ones we felt that are, are very primary as to how is our economy doing. Um, a lot of this affects our tax revenue sources. And the uh, second tier is more business startup and unemployment. So those are the things that we're going to go over next on our, our slides, or those primary um, in the secondary. So on page eight, regarding mortgage foreclosures, um, as you can see, it's been a very steady um, decline with um, the sheriff deeds. And basically what a sheriff deed is, is that there is a, um, a mortgage that is um, the sales posted five times in legal news. All right, so there's the process with all this. And um, it has to post the date, time, and the place. And then on the day of the sale, the sheriff stands in the courthouse. They have the sale. Anybody can buy the property as long as it's $1 more than the mortgage. If no one else purchases it, then the bank will foreclose on it. So that's kind of what the sheriff deed is. Um, and as you can see, it's been a steady decline um, since 2009. Um, which is good. Um, and then, yeah, go ahead. Just a just a quick question on that on that slide for clarification. Um, this is this is showing the total amount of um, foreclosed properties sold through the sheriff's deed, not the total amount of actual foreclosed properties. Is that correct? These are the ones where um, it was through a sheriff deed where it was the ones that were actually sold. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's a, um, yes. And I, I think this question may be more for Mike um, or the treasurer who's not here. Um, is that more due to the change that Karen made with bundling the properties together? No, I would I would, I would attribute the decline just to improved economy. Is, isn't this different altogether than tax foreclosure? This is mortgage foreclosure, These are mortgage right? Foreclosures. It is. I see. But okay. The reduction okay. is just the economy's better. More people are able to pay the bills. Okay. Thank you. But, but again, just to clarify, sheriff sales are direct directly related to a mortgage company mm -hmm. foreclosing, not us. Okay. Right. So this is a positive thing for our economy, it's showing that we have a strong economy. Um, any other questions on this? And of course, you know, it's all on board docs for anybody who wants to look at it. It's right. always publicly available. All right. So on page nine, this is our tax base. Um, so you have 67% as residential, personal properties nine, industrial three, agriculture eight, and then commercial is 13. So this is what we consider our tax base. Um, So on the next page is the, um, the state equalized value and the market increase trend. Um, if you look at the bottom of the slide, it shows um, the, the, um, the legend. It is actually broken down between 17, 18, and 19 as an estimate, and then agricultural, commercial, industrial, residential, and development. Um, one thing that I want to mention about developmental is that the process for placing property in developmental category has changed over the years. And so back in 17 and 18, those were years where they were pulling property out of developmental and de the developmental property and putting it into like appropriate category because it wasn't being marketed as developmental property. So it's not a decrease in value. It's just the assessor reassigning the properties. So I want to point that out there. And basically, develop, prop, developmental property is just property where the value in exchange is just greater than the value in use. For example, that was given to me is um, agriculture property at, at the uh, interstate interchange. 
if, we, if that were to be sold, it would you'd be sold higher than if it was sold for agriculture. That's an example. But again, they're only putting property in developmental now if it's been actively marketed as developmental. So in 19, that's why there's a positive amount there, is that there was some property um, that was placed in developmental. May I chime in too there? Uh, what, what you often see there in regard to developmental property, as the economy improves, um, developers start asking uh, property owners, uh, hey, is that property developable? And if it's, as she indicated, that's a prime location. Anything that's on an uh, interstate, so you have agricultural property, it's been farmed and it's perfectly fine farm property, but since it's right off the exit at an interstate, it's other, it's, it's, uh, there's a higher and better use, if you will, economically, um, by selling it to, dare I say, a gas station or something like that. So that's why the value changes on that. Generally, those are good signs when you see developmental property coming in. That means our economy is still up on the, uh, on the upside because they're still looking to develop. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. On the next slide, on 10, this is assessed versus taxable value. And um, if you think back in 1994, at one time, assessed value and taxable value were the same. And then we had Proposal A, which changed the, the way taxable value is to be increased. So it's either the rate of inflation or 5% or whichever's less between the two. So that's why we have a difference between the two. The other, um, if you have transfer of ownership, or if you have improvements to property, it can increase more than inflation, but not more than the assessed value. So keep that in mind as we're going through the slides, because you're going to see some, pro some positives where we have some incre um, in increase in improvements, increase in sales. Those are opportunities for us to have increased tax revenue, OK? This is my opportunity for my annual uh, <laughs> uh, tirade about how we fund local government in Michigan. Um, as, as uh, Cecilia said, you know, 5% are inflation, the lesser of the two. So if inflation's 2.5%, you know, um, realistically, we could get two point, something less than 2.5. It'll always be something less because it's individual properties, not the aggregate. And I know it's in the weeds, and I can explain more later if you'd like. <laughs> but if inflation goes above 5%, and in any particular care, uh, uh, like health care frequently is, is more than 5% inflation annually, uh, we don't recover those kind of expenses. So if inflation as a whole is above 5%, our revenue is held to something less than 5%, while our cost might be going up by 8%. And that's where you start getting the larger and larger divide over time. So while Proposal A, I understand it, I was in government at the time, back in 94 when they did it. Uh, totally uh, understand why you were pricing people out of their homes due to taxes, retirees in particular. But at the same time, uh, the long-term effect of Proposal A puts local governments in a precarious position to fund uh, government just because of the disparity there. Um, again, if anybody wants to get in the weeds more on that afterward, just you know, feel free to sit down and I'll explain it all to you. All right. So from, if you look at the taxable one, it um, squares the one at the bottom. Between, set between 17 and 18, there was a 2.89 increase in taxable value. But whenever we look at our actual revenues that we received in 17 to 18, the increase was actually 3.1. So that would be attributable to increased um, sales and improvements to property. So that was, a, that was another positive thing, too. So any other questions on this slide? Okay, so on the next slide, we're talking about the residential sales trends. So the red line is the actual sales, which is what we want to see. Um, and it has increased steadily over the past few years. And those, that's where we, again, where when there's a transfer of ownership, that's also the opportunity for us to have increase in tax base above inflation. So we want to see that. What we don't want to see, which has been a very positive trend, is we want to see the decline in the sheriff deeds and the bank sales. That's a very, so it's very positive for our economy and what's going on for the future. Any questions? All right. 
On our next slide is we're talking about the consumer price index, CPI. So basically for the Med Midwest re region at the end of February, inflation was 1.3%. Um, and just based on the graph and what's been happening over back, back, you know, in 18, we're kind of projecting between two and two and a half percent for 2020. Um, I feel like it's going to be closer to two, but that's kind of what we're looking at right now. Um, which, you know, I don't know what else to say about that. <laughs> yeah, I'm, she's conservative. I, I'm pulling for 2.5 percent myself. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I don't know, I struggle. Right, right. Remember, when we budget tax dollars or any revenue, we have to get it. So, Yeah, but. we have yin and yang. It works good. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, wrong way. I need someone to run this for me. Okay, cost of living. This is very, very good. This is a very um, positive thing. Um, this is good news because it's affordable to live here in Jackson. Um, we're 85% of the U.S. average, and which is about 100 percent so if you look at the different categories um, and how they're weighted, um, it's, it's way below the national average of, of 100. So it's very positive, too, for uh, the future of, of our economy in Jackson County that, you know, the cost of living is so low. Any questions? On 15 is um, we're talking. This is the new um, new construction, and this is where um, it's very where we can see that renovations are up over the past few years too. It's been like a 60 percent increase from 2010 to 2018. Um, just kind of shows that um, consumer confidence is rising, and there's a stabilization um, in our economy. And again, this is also what we want to see again, because with new improvements to property, it also helps our tax base increase. Any questions? Okay. And the next slide is our population. Um, the latest number that I could get was at the end of 17, um, 158,640, which has increased a little bit over 16. And it, and it is starting to go back up from the decline that we had back in 2015. I have just a quick question on okay, that. Um, just with the, uh, you mentioned the increase there. Was there anything in particularly uh, that was going on during that time that would show us the data as to why we saw that increase? Obviously, there's people moving in, but were there any... Um, significant businesses that were brought in at the time or anything that would be like an indicator that would show that? Of why just, the population went up? Yeah, I'm just curious. I don't have anything right, um, any data to, to show why. Um, does anybody in the commissioners have any idea? Yeah, yeah, I don't either. There's, it's it's a positive thing. Sure. Maybe more babies. Great. I don't know. County overall population went up, ticked up a little bit. And, and well, yeah, there's more people working. But, you know, the, um, it, it's one year. Mm -hmm. You know, next year, you know. I, I, I'm hoping it's going to go up again. Yeah. Now one the one year does like not make a trend or even make it, you know, because it's not like they went out and counted. These are their estimates based on whatever survey data, statistical analysis they did. Yes, sir. I, I think it's because of the great things we're doing in the county. Yes, there we go. definitely. <laughs> it's only a 400 per person set. leap. So. Yeah. Cold winter, baby boom, who knows. But <laughs> I just wanted just to note, and the reason why I ask that is that anytime that we see an increase, I think it's important to note or to pay at least pay attention to what's going on in that time so we can kind of pinpoint and say, hey, what are some changes that we've made or what businesses have come in that would bring such growth so that we can continue to keep doing those positive things so that we can continue to see growth. That's That was the reason why I asked the no, question. No, that's perfect. That's very good. Totally agree. <laughs> All right, on the next slide is um, our business startups and, and closures. Um, so basically looking at this trend over since 2015, there's about approximately 500 DBAs a year that have been issued. Um, 
So, and the dissolutions are minimal. So there are people who are um, applying for the DBAs. I mean, keep in mind, they're, you know, they're small business owners, but that's still, it's still a business. It's still showing, you know, a growth in, um, within the business community. So, so this, we see this as very as positive because it's 500 a year, new ones. Now this is like one of my favorite slides. I'll show you. The unemployment rate trend. Um, as I'm sure everybody knew someone who was unemployed back in 2009 and just the negative impact that it had on families and the community. And it's just um, very encouraging and exciting to see the trend continuing to, to drop. So at the end of 2018, we're at 3.8% for unemployment for the county. So pretty much our, um, um, a summary is our foc uh, foreclosures are down in their level. Um, home sales, sales are up. The inflation, we have good inflation. New construction, there's also an increase in population the increase. So we see that as positive impacts when we're trying to project our, our revenues for 2020. There isn't anything that we're concerned about or that we feel cautious about. Everything looks really good based on history, what we know today, how we can project in the future. And, um, and then the secondary indicators are, are, are the same. Business startup closures, their steady unemployment's improved and delinquents rate is also improved. So those, the, even the secondary indicators are very positive. Um, so when we're, um, so what we're projecting for property tax for 2020, again, between two and two and a half percent increase, just kind of depends, um, you know, it, it's going to be in that range. <laughs> so we're looking at an increase of tax revenue of 446800 up to 558500 when we're working on putting our budget together for 2020 of additional revenue. So when we're looking at other significant revenues, if um, has to, um, we're not seeing any change within intergovernment, intergovernmental revenue, which is majority of our states and grants. When we were looking at the earlier slides, our investment interest um, that it, there's not going to be any increase that's going to affect the general fund in addition to what we already receive, or revenue sharing. Revenue sharing is pretty flat. We'll get about three million, three point five million from the state. It's not going to be changing significantly. Same with court fees. We're not seeing any increase on the court fees. So pretty much all of those revenues are pretty much going to be steady. We're not seeing any, any increase or, or decrease. So, so if you look on, so the final slide, the total revenue impact then is pretty much an increase in our property revenues of the, ones, of the amounts that I told you with that range. Everything else is pretty flat, yeah. Questions, anyone? Comments? You're welcome. Somebody gonna take care of that? Okay. Next, Jeff has an, uh, I'm sure, enlightening and, and inspiring presentation for us. Good morning. 
So I am going to start so we're all talking from the same uh, point of view. I'm going to show a fly through video of both the fairground improvements or Keeley Park improvements and the uh, new event, America One Events Center. So if all goes well, this video will come up. Jeff, that's the one that's on board docks for us to look at too, or not? Uh, yes, there should be one on board oh. docks. It, uh, come on. Let's hope it goes well. Come on, Kofi may have to help me. It's a big file. Yeah. It happens on my laptop. So I'm clicking and it doesn't seem to... Try this video and see. Doesn't seem to want to play either video this morning. Here, you want the mouse? Okay. Sorry. Life of technology. There we go. We're off and running. So this is this this first part of the video shows the um, current location of all of the various buildings. Gives you an idea of where the new America One Event Center is located on site, where the new vendor area will be located. Our existing performance area is not changing, and obviously the uh, infield of the old track is becoming the uh, Carnival Ride area or Midway. This system, I don't think. I, yeah, I don't. It plays on that, but is it playing on that? Sorry, <laughs> I call it Muzak. So one of the things as we're watching this that's of note is that the uh, the drainage system, the stormwater management system that has been built into this site uh, over the last hundred years, actually you draw a line right down the middle of the uh, grandstand across to the middle of the gumper and there's a north and a south and it's our actually designed to drain to the north, the north piece through uh, two, two drains that um, dump into the Grand River um, down by Barn 3 off of North Avenue. Uh, everything that we're working on construction-wise was designed through two pipes, one just in front of the Gumper and one out near Ganson Street that ran into the... Uh, so we're having to be very careful in the design um, because we're not working on the north piece of the site not to uh, interrupt any of that na that drainage system that's been designed. If we did, we'd have to file for a separate MDEQ permit, and, uh, and we haven't filed for that because we didn't intend to work on that. So the north end of the infield will not change. It will continue to be the area during the fair that uh, um, they do a lot of the large horse, draft horse exhibitions and activities. Um, and the remainder of the year, it'll, it'll act as uh, open space and uh, parking for certain events on the north end. So that gave you an, a, a view of what's being built out in the site improvement portion of the project. I'm here today to talk about the actual America One uh, event center, the new event center, and this will give you a view of both the outside and uh, a sense of what the inside will look like. So 
So that was the uh, obviously entry view. This is from Ganson Street facing southeast uh, towards Ganson Street and the Grand River. This is actually along the side along or parallel to the Grand River and is our uh, uh, also an area where we do all of our load in and backroom support. You'll see they snuck in a picture of a future path right there uh, in the tree line. Um, this is the uh, air plaza area, events plaza area uh, between the Gumper and the back of the new event center. And then we're back to the front. Those are offices uh, uh, setting to your left. And now we're going to go inside the building. So this is what you'll see when you first enter. This is our pre-function space. There's about 4,000 square feet of pre-function space that can be used for a variety of events. Uh, they're taking you into the uh, park and fair offices first. There's about 2,000 square feet dedicated to our administrative offices. And then we're going to walk back down the uh, pre-function space. Um, the entry to your left here is into the men's and women's restroom area and will also take you into the one of the doors. It'll take you into the event center. And as we come around the corner, the doors straight ahead take you into the uh, public meeting space, which is uh, uh, 1,800 square foot in size would be comparable to this space without the uh, pillars. Um, but first we're going to go through another set of doors and into the, uh, the, the big box, the event center itself, which is 20,000 square feet to give you a comparison. Uh, the current America one is about 14,000 square feet and very linear. This is 20,000 square feet and, and much more of a, uh, of a square box, which is important uh, for staging events. The uh, Home Builders Association just happens to be running a show on the day this video is produced. This bulkhead is important. This bulkhead actually has a, a door that comes out of the wall. It's a or a wall. It's a solid acoustical wall that will go across on a track and split this into two functional spaces: one 6,000 square feet and the other one 14,000 square feet. So we can have two events going on. This is the public meeting space I mentioned earlier. Um, that can be used for training. This will hold about, uh, uh, well, we've had it laid out uh, in classroom style with, with desks and seats. It holds 80 people. This is the back room catering kitchen, 1,400 square feet designed to uh, uh, be able to service um, a banquet of 500 people in the round. So we'll be able to, the, the, we aren't doing any cooking here. We're doing for refrigerating, we're doing uh, warming of food, and we're doing cleaning of dishes, plates, um, anything that needs to be cleaned. So that, that gives us a reference point to work from. So again, this is uh, just another view of the pre-function space without it moving very quickly. Um, the doors, again, to the right are into the public meeting space. The other end is the offices. Um, and there's three sets of doors. At the far left end near the offices, you'll see a set of doors into the main box where the group of folks have gathered underneath the, uh, the wood uh, the beams. Uh, that also has a door that accesses the main box and then the doors to the right here uh, next to the uh, uh, where everyone is gathered to the right also take you into the big box um, just as a reference point. Uh, 
again, the primary space is 20,000 square feet and can be broken out into two separate spaces. Um, and again, it is a, a, an acoustical wall which allows for two events to go on at the same time. Um, the, the, the public meeting space that will be outfitted with um, some uh, me media equipment similar to what you have here to allow for uh, training and uh, various public meetings and presentations. Um, this is a view from the uh, office end looking back towards uh, you out the windows at the end there you're looking out into Ganson and uh, the corner of the Grand River. Uh, catering kitchen space again. Public office space and architecturally this is the front view. This is the, the, the view that looks into that public meeting space as well as the pre-function space and uh, uh, faces out uh, onto a lawn between uh, this building and Ganson and the Grand River. This is the back loading dock area and uh, also a space that will accommodate a future uh, trail along the Grand River. Uh, this is the events plaza area that uh, works uh, in conjunction with the uh, Gumper building and creates a, a nice one acre uh, of outdoor events space. Those four large doors open directly into so those can all be opened and uh, people can move freely between the 20,000 square feet in the big box and the um, large event space on the outside so those can be used in conjunction. This is the floor plan. My, uh, uh, I do want to point out that I added some slides last night after uh, uh, communicating back and forth with Mike, so I will get you the updated slide presentation. There are a few more pictures, basically, um, for you to view. And then this is, uh, uh, gives you a relationship of where everything lays out. A is the New America One Event Center, so you get a sense of where it's located on site in relationship to B, which is the existing America One Center, which isn't being torn down. That, that's been the, between the, that being torn down and D, the grandstand being torn down, those have been the two big rumors on uh, social media that we keep saying no and communicating, but somehow they, they still persist. Neither are being torn down. So how did we get here? So I want to take you through some, some background. This is uh, what the site looks like. Well, this is what it looked like 10 days ago. Today, um, the south end of the track is gone. Uh, all of the asphalt parking on the south end of the site, the majority of our parking is gone. Uh, there are large pieces of equipment moving earth both on the site and as well as digging the uh, foundations for the uh, new event center. So the existing or the history of Keeley Park and, and its events include the original exhibition building which is the current America One. Underneath that metal skin is an old uh, very architecturally beautiful brick structure uh, that uh, that exists that's, uh, that's had uh, uh, metal siding sometime in the 1980s clad over the front of it. Um, it became the Rollatorium, which was, which is what I venture many of you remember it as. Um, and you see that's an actual picture of folks roller skating inside the, uh, the current America One Event Center. Um, there was a major fire at one point that did severe damage. Um, and eventually it uh, no longer acted as a rollatorium and resumed its original purpose as an events and exhibition spaces, which is what it's used for today. There are many reasons why, by the way, that it's, it's, it's inadequate and we're where we are today building a new facility, most of them you're aware of. Um, it it, it shape-wise creates challenges. It's a one-trick pony at 14,000 square feet. It's a little too big for a lot of the public meeting, training types of things. Acoustically, the way it's designed, it uh, doesn't work well for those. And it's quite frankly too small for many of the events that we are contacted about. Um, and even some of them that run in the building but complain constantly about needing much more space. So we can't create more space on it at the moment. Uh, uh, and uh, it would take a major investment to, uh, to rework it um, as it is to, to work acoustically um, for, uh, 
for many of the events that we do. Several years ago, county leaders in America One Credit Union began discussions about the need for an appropriate indoor community space to accommodate larger events, banquets, public presentations, and other community activities. Um, in 2016, the County Commission approved the Jackson County Fairgrounds Master Plan, and that plan included the development of a new America One Event Center along the Grand River, and that was really a central focus of the plan. In October of 2017, America, Credit, America One Credit Union announced they would invest $4 million in the new event center project at Keeley Park. Um, they had some conditions for that investment that included a, being able to accommodate 500 guests in a banquet style setup, offering a more upscale environment compared to the existing event center, full service, ki full size kitchen, excuse me, capable of serving a large audience. Um, the project would be developed using a design build approach that's important in the remainder of my presentation, but, but they were very specific. We had conversations about other methods for developing the project and they were very insistent that uh, that their, with their investment it would be a design build approach to to development and then last but not least they wanted naming rights in January of last year 15 months ago the County Commission approved a design build agreement with Rockford construction construction excuse me to partner with the county and our stakeholders to create a design for the new event center keep it in mind we were starting from scratch in a design build approach you don't have a design that you put out and a construction company bids on and you immediately know your pricing you've hired a company you've established and set aside an amount of money they need to know that in order for them to enter the project so you enter an agreement with a with a budget and then you go out and you design the building and then after you design the building you bid out all of the subs and you discover what the market value is and you hope you hit your mark and that's design build <coughs> and uh, uh, in theory, it's supposed to be faster, but we're an example of it doesn't always happen that way. S Steve, there's a question. The contract signed with for this design build project. Uh -huh. right, the contract signed for this design build project had a maximum not to exceed price of six million. It did. I'm familiar with design build contracts, mm -hmm. and the basic principle is you design within the funding limits mm -hmm. clients don't come up with well we sort of have this much money uh, design it and then we'll come up with more if you need more that's not the way these contracts typically go if you got a a, a maximum construction cost of six million yep you design within that limit y and if your initial designs are over that limit you're obligated to redesign it yep you're absolutely right and you have to have a crystal ball in this case in a currently in a very rapidly changing market because you have six million so we we design to a six million dollar number and Rockford is our is, is we're Rockford's clients so we meaning the county we meaning the county make the request for the type of design we want Rockford says you can't afford that and we continue through a process eventually we land at a place that we believe we've designed to the right place again this is all designed so you're guessing you're guessing based on the market at that time you never know until your last bids are in our last bids came in less than 30 days ago and that was a big chunk of the project what we believe to be true in the market 15 months ago has changed dramatically I, I can't control that. I make no apology to that. What we can do now is go in and attempt to cut. But there is very little to cut without starting over and costing ourselves a significant amount of additional design dollars. Because Rockford didn't enter a guarantee. They entered a with a budget, and they knew what that budget was, and we knew what that budget was, and we did our darndest to design to that budget. But again, I can't control the changing market. Um, I've lost a lot of sleep over a changing market at this point because the, the pricing that existed 15 months ago has evaporated. I'm lucky if I can find contractors to bid on the project because they're all so busy. 
we've had a lot of contractors, including many locals, who have called us and apologized but didn't bid on the project. So, material, you know, I, I, I also didn't in, invent the situation that we're in with materials. Materials have been affected by supply and demand um, because of the robust construction market we're in, not just in Michigan, but across the country. But material prices have been affected greatly by federal trade policy. So the price of steel has gone through the roof. The price of, um, of uh, uh, sheetrock has gone through the roof in the last 15 months as we, we uh, look at not making a political comment, just saying that when we talk tariffs, they have impact on materials and supply availability. So those are all things that were moving parts. And so in a design build is, is never, and that's why we're back here now, defining this today as a guaranteed maximum price. The six million wasn't a guaranteed maximum price. That's what some people will enter into. We could have entered into a, a guaranteed maximum price with Rockford um, back then. We intentionally didn't because we didn't know what the, um, we didn't know what it is we were building. We had no clue. I reviewed the contract last night. Yep. I was able to bring it up and look at it. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't say a budget of six million. It says a not to exceed cost of six million. Yeah, not a budget. Well, that that is the budget we set. No, well, the contract it, it does not use the word budget. Well, that, right, and we're here asking for a change order because okay, did it we does ask not Rockford fit? to value engineer some of the project or some of the materials? We have value engineered this thing to the nth degree, and I'll go through that with you. But we have value yeah. engineered it I'd to the go nth that degree because I've yeah. I've gone through these drawings and I see materials that could be changed and not impact the visual character of the well, building at all. Well, we might we might very well disagree with you, but okay. we can go with there. So, anyways, we had a stakeholder meetings, um, and this is where the design process began. Um, we had uh, uh, a variety of organizations involved. Uh, particularly America One was at the table. Um, our tourism industry was at the table. Um, the county commissioners were invited. Fair board members, park board members uh, were invited. Um, and we walked through a process where folks visioned the kind of building they wanted. I want to say again, at this point, we could have talked about a metal skin building. Um, we would have had, as it turns out, I didn't know then, know now, we would have had some challenges with the, with, with the city and, and our relationship there and their expectations based on their code. Um, but more importantly, it wasn't what you all told us in these stakeholder meetings that you visioned this building to be. Um, and so we, we looked at other types of construction materials. Uh, we ended up with a building that is durable so it's going to last a much longer period of time. It has flexibility to do large and small events. So you have a much uh, better market, which leads to more financial stability and trying to maintain the building long term, um, operate it long term. Uh, it's a more energy efficient building, which saves you in the long run. We could have used less lesser expensive materials again. but. You know, at the end of the day, if you're spending an extra $50,000 a year on energy and you do the math over 10 or 20 years, you really didn't save. You lost. You're better off making the investment up front. And then you can see the success factors, the sustainability, low maintenance, a lot of the same, same, same issues. And here's the final design that we ended up with. Again, aesthetically, we could remove a lot of this material, but it wouldn't be the same building. And that's, a, again, that's going to be a matter, it was then, it took us three months to get through the style and appearance of the building because people had differing opinions on what the building should look like and how it should represent Jackson County as a whole and Jackson County government. And this is the architectural. So there are some, some uh, uh, stone, there is cedar, uh, there are, are, are metal, there are materials here that aren't the least expensive. They are durable. And they are aesthetically pleasing, and that was a decision that was made um, in the project. In Oct 
October of 2018, Rockford began the uh, process of obtaining subcontractors, um, worked really hard the local market. We're proud to say we ended up with a number of, of uh, uh, very uh, uh, talented local contractors working on the project. Um, in November, we started meeting with the city officials to go through plan review, which took nearly three months. Um, but we, we got through it and found a, a middle ground. Um, the bidding process was completed in March, at which point we, uh, we were at $6,422,423, which we recognize um, is, uh, is over the original $6 million uh, number. And uh, we're uh, basically the development agreement with the city was approved uh, last week, two weeks ago. Um, uh, their city council approved it, and uh, we have permits for construction. And then in April uh, 1st, yesterday, actually it was last week, but I had already done the slide presentation, we broke ground, and uh, that's what the site looks like as of yesterday afternoon. Um, so where are we now? Uh, Rockford has equipment and personnel on site, and they're excavating contractor D&E, a local excavating uh, uh, spinoff, if you're all familiar with D&E. It's the son of the Dunnigan family, and he's doing most of these types of projects where D well, Dunnigan's focusing heavily on road projects. Um, we've completed preliminary value engineering. We've done things like remove tectum, which was an acoustical sound um, material that's very expensive. It was two inches of it up in the ceiling of the big box because we heard loud and clear from our stakeholders that acoustics were a huge issue. Um, they didn't want a reverberating box like the current America one is. We removed that and are using on a spray-on material that we think will work just as well. But as a result of that, we got rid of the con stained concrete floors and went with a, a carpeted event center, which is pretty common for banquet style spaces and the kinds of carpet materials they make now. You can drive vehicles on them. You can spill, remember beer fest, you can spill beer on them and, uh, and they clean. So anyways, uh, we've done value engineering, the co uh, county commission agreement with Rockford 15 months ago had the $6 million number. Uh, that number uh, you know, there were, like I said, crystal ball the contingent on defining a concept that we wanted, we meaning the community, and basing a real market construction price on that. Um, and uh, this is where we landed. Based on the current conditions for construction, we're asking for a $422,423 change order, uh, or roughly 6%, and locking into, at this point, a guaranteed maximum price. Where, what are affecting the market conditions? As I said earlier, increased construction material prices, labor prices in the construction industry, the sh shrinking workforce is killing them. Um, finding tra trades labor is very difficult. Um, the improved economy locally and nationally is uh, really pushed up demand for contractors. And then last but not least, if I could build this, go back a year and a half or even two years ago and build it in a different economy, uh, we would probably get a different outcome. Um, the projected schedule, the foundation work will be complete by May 1. The main boxes, which are tip-up uh, concrete panels, um, thick 8-inch 30 by 30 panels will uh, be in place by July 1, will be weathered in by October, mechanical and technology will be in by the end of the year. We'll get our finished carpentry painting, uh, uh, all of that done, do our final punch uh, list, and uh, hope to occupy by March of next year. I was asked by Mike, and so I want to put in these last two slides, they really have to do with how does this all relate to the fair and the other part of this, the site project that I talked to you last month about. Uh, if you look at this, you will see the current America one down at the bottom. Um, and you'll see a new walkway leading out to a midway. That, all of that parking and all of those walkways will be in place by the fair. If you draw a line, and we'll just go to it, if you draw this line, uh, the box B is what 
is is it, it is scheduled to be completed before the fair the actual drop-off zones and all of the site improvements and flat work around the America one in a or the blue area will not be completed will not even be started we don't want to start that work until we actually are substantially uh, ahead in the building because what happens is if I install all of that and then I got my fish and finished carpentry guys and I got my my HVAC and plumbing guys driving their trucks all over our brand new concrete dripping oil from their trucks and getting tire marks all over it just makes a complete mess so we generally wait to do the site work around the immediate building itself until we're at a point where most of the heavy equipment has been moved off site and we're down to the to the final trades so we're we've split this with the contractor into two pieces yep sorry I am done questions Commissioner Elwell I've got a number, but I'll try and be brief, and I'll start with a softball. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and it was going to be, where will we be for Fair Week? Jeff, can you go back to that slide that showed that couple slides back? So the, the fairway there, which is up at the top of the screen, is that, it looks like grass from here. Is that the intent? Of this here? The I can't see what you're pointing. Point. That's a nice pointer. <laughs> The, where the fair itself is, the, gra the, the fair rides will be setting on grass. The walkways for the public uh, will be setting on something called DG. Okay. So that was a softball question. Uh, and I, I think it's probably noteworthy to point out that the other PowerPoint that you had before this one that we didn't have access to was really just a conceptual fly-through of what it would look like. So... Yeah. We shouldn't come back to you in a year and say, well, this looks different than what you showed us. It was based, just conceptual, correct? Yes, it was based on uh, construction data as opposed to what might happen in the field as we make adjustments. Okay. Now maybe the tougher questions. So uh, my first one, they're no particular order, but what will be left to pay for after this approval if it comes, and of course it won't be today, I don't think, uh, to fully complete the project? Well, oh, I like that big sigh. Well, <laughs> because because to complete the building, nothing. That's the, the guaranteed maximum price is the guaranteed maximum price. Now, the contract does have a couple of exclusions, but we are, but we believe we're past those. They're both geotechnical. We're digging in the ground. We had um, a virologic do testing. So we believe we understand everything there is under the building. And again, we're going to pour footings next week. We're not building a basement, so we're not going real deep. So the long story here, or the, the short of it is that if they were to find contamination in the site and had to pay to remove it, it was always in, in every, every contract is excluded because it's an unknown. But we didn't find any of that at this point, and so we don't anticipate any cost. So as far as the building goes, we're locked in. We have other things that... that different parts of the organization need to acquire like the office is not the event center's fault the office is a park office that manages the entire park system so I've got to buy office equipment as an example well so or move, or move office equipment or move office equipment and scrounge what I can find but but I think in all fairness so you're looking for what 422 which is what seven percent of the project yeah and I think that as we sit here having to make that decision, not, well, I'm jumping around, but to clarify, we're not going to decide this today, correct, Mike? Correct. Okay. No. So a, as we sit in the decision-making of that, I think it would be good for all of us to know truly what we're going to have left to pay for at the end. Now, that doesn't have to be told today. Yep. Uh, but I think we should have a good grasp of what else is it going to cost us and where's the money going to come from. Yeah. yeah. So that's again just for later reference maybe uh, so Tony kind of asked this one already but I'll ask it again is there anything that we can cut to make up the difference and I threw another thing on are there any elements that were built into this plan that are a requirement from the city or requested by the city but we truly don't have to comply to that we could save money by not doing uh, not on the building um, we, on the project I'm talking about. Okay. On the project, we, we have removed, we found there were, there were things on the project that they required that we did not want to comply. We didn't feel. They requested them, but they, were not requested.
required to do that. We're right? not under the current development agreement. They allowed the exemptions, and we found a happy, happy place. Okay, and all those have been cut out? Yes. Okay. Uh, this maybe is more one for Mike than you, but so where will we be percentage-wise in relation to our policy on our reserve? You're, you're talking about 422000 additional that would come from fund balance or reserve, right? And our policy requires, what, 18 to 24 percent? I do not anticipate taking it from the general fund reserve. I'll be going to our capital budget for that. I just, I think I said reserve, but... Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, and how, how does this relate to the rest of the budget work that we have to do this year? I mean, we know that this coming budget year is going to be a tough budget, correct? Correct. These are, there are two different budgets, really, capital and there's right. operational. Uh, I'm primarily focused on capital here. What this really means is we will have to, we will be able to do less projects for a couple of years. It's just that simple. We'll have to postpone some uh, build outs. I know there's um, uh, a project over at the courthouse. They would like to, uh, there's like 20 uh, uh, Michigan Department of Probation officers over there. They're adding forum bodies, so they need more offices, bigger space. It needs remodeled. You're talking a few hundred thousand. They will have to uh, get by with the existing furniture uh, and space uh, because of this project. We we'll have to postpone that for another, at least another year. So I, I think we would be wiser. You would be wise, Mike, to tell us uh, as you weigh which of those we're not going to do that we had talked about doing. Give us that list so we know. I mean, I I just think that would be valuable to us. We can talk hesitant, about we, we no. can talk about that. Well, because okay. you're asking me to create a list and tell a whole bunch of other elected people they're well, not getting their project this year and create a whole lot of other challenges that we don't necessarily need to have that fight right yet. I, I just see us getting grief if we're taking money from other potential projects that had been planned, and I, I want to know ahead of time yeah, what the Yeah, that I agree be. with. Uh, the project I just mentioned um, is brand new. It's The state has decided they're going to add four more bodies, and it's the law says that we have to house them. It's one I'm not the, saying I won't do it. I just want to know ahead of time so we can... Uh, later look back and say we have adequately weighed sure, whether sure. we can or should do this. The, uh, yeah, I, I agree. And Jeff, can, do you have a breakdown of the 400000 I know 100000 or so of that was contingency. Um, and you, well, that was one of my other questions. You, hope you don't have to spend it, but it's there if you do. Yeah, um, I'm trying to think of where And I know it. any value engineering, is a, as I read the document, any savings you come up with over the course of this next year to build this thing it comes off of that number. Correct. We have 114,000 um, set aside for contingency. The contingency belongs to us. So if we don't have any change orders or surprises from this point forward, that that contingency would be used for that will come back to us, and that this number will go down by 100 or 114. In addition, we have the ability to continue to try to value engineer in the field um, as as we're going along and continue to, I want to say it in a pleasant way, work with our subcontractors to find lower costing, all of that savings comes back to us. So our goal will be to reduce, uh, you know, I don't see it being 400,000, but I believe there's 100, 150,000 that we can reduce this by. So you have not spent the contingency as part of this 442000 or on top of that, correct? You're still holding right. that contingency. Right, that contingency is in the, the 6422000 So it's it, that's part of that number. And that's about, what, 2% uh, contingency? Yeah, right reporting? now it's at 2.1, 2 2.2. It's 114000 And that was what we built in from the start? No, we've been shaving contingency off as we go. There was a design. This is a construction side, but there was a design contingency, but we're through design. So, Where did we start percentage or dollar-wise, if you know? Uh, we were carrying 7%, 6%, right in that neighborhood of total Almost contingency. Almost 400000 Yeah. Uh, and then back to one that we, I talked briefly about. In uh, It sparked my attention when you talked about media equipment and the kitchen equipment. So are the and hopefully you can come up with a list of what will be left for right. the complete project, not just right. the building of the building, but so 
is media equipment and kitchen equipment included in what we're paying for already or not? Th those are not part of Rockford's contract. They are not. Rockford, and, and that wouldn't that wouldn't be unusual. You you almost never put those in the, so those are always left to the owner to purchase. So we have estimates, well, actually more than estimates, we have hard costs for the, the kitchen. Uh, there aren't, again, there aren't a lot of kitchen designers around in Michigan, so we, we've worked with one that we found that we, we liked, and so we have that number, and then we, uh, the audio-visual, um, we're still, much as Steve said, with office equipment, we own a number of pieces of audio-visual equipment, so we're looking at what we have, what we need, those types of things. What is in the project, and is the most important part right now, is the conduit and chases and the wiring to get to the locations. So for us, it's the, the as, as well as in the kitchen, all of the powers in place, all of the, the wirings in place, it's the actual equipment that we have to buy. Would you say that uh, there was a perception by us that the kitchen equipment, for instance, was included in what we were paying for from the start? Since I haven't had a lot of conversations with you guys, I'm not sure what your perception would be. I think the public often thinks that, uh, much like in buying a home, that, oh, when I walk into the house, there'll be a refrigerator, and there'll be a, a, a dishwasher, and there'll be a microwave. Um, but those aren't things that are generally included in the construction cost with the contractor, because they're personal to the owner. And every owner has a different brand, has a different style. So they accommodate the power and the location for those, but the owner buys those. So uh, I... I wouldn't be surprised if that's a perception, but it's almost never the case. Okay. That's all my questions. Thank you, Jeff. I've been doing a lot of looking up of previous documents, things that were presented before I was on the board. Uh, going through the uh, investment cost to support project construction, uh, one of the items that comes up to a total of six million was furniture, fixtures, equipment, six hundred thousand. Can you tell me what furniture, fixtures, and equipment was included in that six hundred thousand dollar number? You mean the six million dollar or in that six hundred thousand dollar? Um, yeah, that you've got your kitchen equipment, you've got your AV equipment, you've got your depending on how far you're going to go. And again, that's a, that's a, a matter of preference, your security cameras. Um, and then you've got your office equipment. Those are the f four, four biggies. Um, so the, ki so ki the kitchen will have some equipment in it? Yes, the kitchen will need to have some equipment in it. That was not part of or isn't part of, um, the c again, the, con the construction company builds out and needs to know where the equipment's going to go, needs to know the size of the kitchen uh, so that they can make sure that all the infrastructure is in place. And so that's part of the sub, the electrical subcontractor, in this case, uh, Hearst Electric here in Jackson, Mike Hearst. So he needs to know what is it you're going to have in your kitchen. And so that's all in the contractor's price. But I got to go out and buy the refrigerator. I got to go out and buy the freezer. I got to go out and buy the, the, the um, dishwasher, the microwave, the coffee maker. Those are all things that we have to go out and buy. And those are in the FF&E. The wiring and stuff, furniture, fixture, and equipment. The wiring and all the things to hook those up to is in the construction side. So the wiring and the plumbing. Yep will be included in the six million. Yep. And how much of the kitchen equipment is included in the six million? None. None of the actual equipment. Um, no, no refrigerators, no freezers, no microwaves, no coffee makers. Those are things that we go out and buy as the owner. Okay, then I'm still missing something. From the original budgeting, what was included in the furniture, fixtures, and equipment? We know it's not the plumbing. Well, I just told you. I electric. just told you. It's the kitchen equipment. It's the uh, uh, office equipment. It's the AV, and it's the security. <laughs> that originally was part of the six million, and now it's not, it's beyond the. No, six it was a part of a budget I put together. It wasn't part of Rockford six million. It was not. Rockford is budgeted. Okay. Far. There's nothing in the contract, the AI contract, that details those pieces. Well, it wouldn't be in the AI contract. It would be in the. Uh, 
drawings and the specifications. Yeah, and it's not in those either, and it hasn't been from the get-go. Those are things the owner buys. Okay, doctor. Jeff, we have to buy tables and chairs for events uh, that people have there, and do you have a place to store them? We we already own a three hundred chairs that we use. Um, at the Manor House and at the Cascades, mostly at the Cascades. Um, they were a, a private gift. Uh, we're acquiring um, another 300 chairs that we, uh, that the Park Board approved last month, uh, that we, so we'll have up to 600 chairs at the Cascades for some of our larger events. Those chairs are actually being bought and their specs match what we need for the event center. So we'll have those on hand with events mostly taking place in the uh, three off-season months and the Cascades happening in the, unfortunately, smaller section we call summer. Um, so we'll share those. Beyond that, we, we wouldn't, and most event centers of our size, wouldn't own um, 1,200 chairs. We would rent them, much like we do for the fair. We, we seat 3,000, 2,800 uh, right in there for Foreigner, for instance, this year um, on the track, and all of those chairs are rented from a local uh, rental company. It's not cost effective to own them and try to store them and repair them. They get damaged. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Um, I have just a couple of quick questions, mm -hmm. and um, we'll move on. Uh, but in, and I think you mentioned it already in the the 422 that you're asking. Mm -hmm. um, how much of that uh, is budgeted for any miscellaneous funds that may come up? Something that you need to buy uh, later. Um, only, only the 114,000 that represented by contingency. Um, the remainder of that is. I, I, I can't break it out into any particular figure cat category. It's it's part of the uh, cost of steel. It's part of the cost of masonry. It's car part of the... Yeah, the, I, I understand. Yeah. Um, and then just backing up real quick, um, under the uh, $6 million, um, previously uh, stated that we've kind of talked about before, um, how much of that was... How much in that was budgeted for any miscellaneous funds? Um, well, we start we started out with, uh, as Dave pointed out, a pretty healthy contingency in there. Um, but again, as How prices, uh, three hundred, roughly three hundred. No, well, four hundred was the number Dave used. I think it was three hundred and sixty-eight or something, as I recall, um, that we start out with. A big chunk of that. 200 of it is always what they refer to as design contingency. Your sure. architect's always worried about uh, us asking them to do too much. So in this case, it was Rockford's architect, but but still there. And so they're worried that they're not going to get their fee. So there's always a design contingency. It got released um, last September. We, really, we, we were far enough along with design that we could start putting out uh, feelers for mechanical, for HVAC, for electrical, for plumbing, and fire suppression. And when we went out into the market looking for contractors for those, we were far enough along that we released the contingency uh, for the architect and were left with uh, a about two and a half percent contingency for construction and then we released a half percent of that two weeks ago while we were doing value engineering is that's how we got to the 114 we're at now or roughly two percent sure sure so I know, I know you've been standing for a little while oh, I'm so fine. I'll, uh, I'm <laughs> I'll, fine. I'll, I'll move on um, I appreciate um, mr. Bear's questions I had several that were very similar so I won't get into the weeds of all that okay. um, but you also mentioned um, uh, the use of local companies is mm -hmm. there any way that we could have a list of the companies that we've um, accepted their bids at all yep. at least just the local ones yep yep I can give you a list of all of them including all of the local ones okay. we have those as of uh, two weeks ago we know exactly who everyone is that will be working on the project and just as an estimate um, could you say how many um, in terms of actual but if you're gonna have the list it doesn't matter yeah. it's okay thank you um, and then Yeah, actually, I think that answers everything. Thank you. Okay, you're um, welcome. No further questions, Mr. Chair. Commissioners, if you have further questions, please give them to Mr. Overton. Remember, this is coming back through committee, so a lot of those questions, can, the answers can be found and be brought to us all to share with the public. You're welcome. Uh-oh. Sorry, Tony. Or <laughs> Kofi, I did something wrong.
I didn't mean to make it go away. Hit one too many X's. Next up, we have Jackson Collaborative Network. I'm not sure who's representing or speaking. AIM, Dr. Schultz. Approaching the podium. And you have a presentation and uh, PowerPoint? We do, yes. And Kofi, if you could make sure that they works. Um, I was going to ask folks to introduce themselves while we're waiting because we have a Sounds like a great idea. Here. So if you guys just want to go around and introduce yourself so he knows who, they know who all is here. Kind of loud for the mic. Sure. My name is Monica Moser and I'm the president and CEO of the Jackson Community Foundation. I'm Irene Lacrone. I'm the Cradle to Career Education Network Coordinator. Soy Lyons, Director for the Department of Health and Human Services. You all know me, Richard Toon, County Health Officer. Toby Berry, the CEO of Community Action Agency. Bill Rail, President of Jackson Air Manufacturers Association. Perfect, thank you. Hi, and I'm Amy Schultz. I'm the Executive Director of Population Health for Henry Ford Allegiance and Jackson Health Network. And we're pleased to be here today to talk to you about our Jackson Collaborative Network updates and um, the opportunity to partner with you on your strategic planning process. So we have provided the uh, slides in the, the packet, so I'm not going to go through all of them. Uh, so I welcome any of our partners to jump in and, and add to um, the dialogue and welcome your questions as well. So um, if you remember when we did our last strategic planning process uh, several years ago, there were we partnered with the county and Jackson 2020 in a strategic planning process that included a number of strands with various focus areas. Since that time, we have really evolved as a network and the collective activities that are still going on today are centralized in the areas that you see represented on this collaborative network slide. So the strands of the Health Improvement Organization, the Cradle to Career Education Network, and the Financial Stability Poverty Reduction Network are those that are working closely in that collective space today. Not to say that there aren't things going on in the other areas where we had other strands. They're just not working in the, the collaborative collective action space in the same way. And what we identified um, through the last several years of working together is that we have a lot of strength and assets in our partnerships that we didn't have back then and that allow us to support each other in following the same values of collaboration and in the way that we're working together in order to embed the work we're doing throughout the community. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. But any questions about the, the collaborative network and what we mean when we're talking about that? So uh, within our network partnerships, we have 120 organizations represented. Our number of members varies uh, between the 350, 500 range, um, and then many of those members who are uh, engaged in the network activities are engaged in multiple work groups or uh, strands, so they are, you see them represented as multiple memberships. And the things that we've focused on collectively is how do we best support collaborative work, which engages multiple organizations working together towards common goals, uh, our focus on some of these key elements. So we're focused on um, systems change, which is not developing new programs, but how do we work um, in different ways together so that we're embedding new processes in our work and being more effective at what we're doing together. Um, we have common values of equity in the work that we're doing, of authentic engagement, meaning that we're engaging our population that we serve as partners and not as recipients of services, and the continuous learning to make sure that we're um, continually innovating, innovating and uh, doing things differently. And then um, one of the pieces that we really have built a lot on as a network is capacity. So making sure that we as a network have capacity to support our partner agencies in doing their work differently. Uh, what you'll see here is the, the three network strands that have been working together very closely and the visions of those. So we have the focus on improving um, health in our community, that we have education and training uh, to achieve an economic prosperity, and that all 
people in Jackson County are financially stable. So those are kind of the, the three visions. And then the way we do our work together is trying to accomplish all of those outcomes together. So what we've been doing lately is engaging in a collective assessment and planning process. So what we've done is collect a bunch of data from various sources, and you've seen some of that in your packet. We have some um, big posters that has that information on it, um, and those are available to any partners who wish to spend time. What we've been doing with a lot of partners is um, doing kind of re mini retreats where we spend time talking about that data and what it means. Uh, to us as a community and to us as service providers for our community. We um, have really focused on how we can better address root causes of those problems. So as you saw in the data, um, various issues that our community is experiencing, we're really interested in how do you get to the root cause of that uh, versus potentially putting Band-Aids on them or creating new programs that might uh, not be sustainable in the long term. Um, and what we're working on uh, then is a shared community action plan to address the uh, most pressing issues for our community. So each strand uh, has a set of action teams that are reviewing their previous action plans, identifying how those plans are addressing the outcomes and the root causes, and then refreshing or revising or completely updating those plans. And that, uh, the result of those plans will also include a shared measurement and dashboard system so that we can be accountable to how we're performing um, to reaching those goals as a whole. Um, one of the, the really important pieces to collective action, so as we're talking about a bunch of different agencies working together around a shared agenda, is how those individual agencies who are participating as partners in that work are going back within their organizations and changing the way they do work. Uh, the way that those organizations are aligning with the community's shared agenda and saying, hmm, what role do we have in this? And what might we do or what might we adopt as a champion um, within this work for our agency to uh, focus on? And how might we operate differently if we were uh, focusing on reducing disparities or um, focused on creating sustainable systems change? So I'm going to skip through some of these detailed slides. Um, and then the community assessment uh, data that I referenced, um, we have, as I mentioned, the, the big posters. And then we've also provided them in a PDF format to uh, Mike and to, I think, the, the uh, commissioners received the full um, data files. But they're also available in the large print setting so that you can view them. Um, we have them here today. But uh, what, what um, many of our partners are doing are looking at them. Um, we do, we're doing that at, at Henry Ford Allegiance, looking at that data to say, um, what does this tell us about our community and what does it tell us the, about the way we need to potentially operate differently knowing our constituent population better? So just um, since we don't have the graphics up, just to spend a couple of minutes um, on the data is what we did was um, use a number of sources of data. So this is data pulled from um, national uh, assessments that are done that are collecting data on different communities. There are state level assessments that are done. There are some that we do in our own community, the National Citizen Survey. Our um, collective network does a shared assessment where we sample uh, um, residents and ask them questions about their experiences. The school systems have a tool that, uh, that is used at the state level um, that asks students about their experiences. So what we did was basically look at all sorts of sources of data and compiled them into some meaningful graphics that would allow us to tell the story of our community a little better. Uh, we did focus a lot on disparities in that data where we were able to see the differences that different populations were experiencing in this slide. You can see particularly as it relates to poverty, the disparities between uh, black children and white children in poverty um, in Jackson County. The majority of the statistics were for the county. Um, where it's for a different uh, demographic or geographic area, it is noted as being for the state or for the city. 
So data on unemployment rate, um, retirement savings, and this is really the stuff that's in your slides. It's just a sampling of that data. So we really would encourage uh, the opportunity to share the full um, data sets and for the commission to have some dialogue about how that, uh, or for the folks who are engaging in the strategic planning process to have some dialogue about how that data could affect the plans. How do you come up with your unemployment rate would be my first question because we throw 3.8. Yep, so the, I have all of the sources for the data here, um, as I mentioned. And sometimes you do find uh, data sources that have different um, reports based on where the data is coming from or the year of the data. Let me see, for the unemployment rate, this is from the um, Census Bureau Fact Finder um, unemployment status. Yeah. I think somebody's this, pointing out it includes 16-year-olds. Is that true or not? That the unemployment rate includes 16-year-olds? I'd have to check that. I think that, I think that I think that question. That right yeah, I think that question may be better asked towards what ours reflects. If our rate that we just reported on, if that includes 16 and up, or if that's 18 and up, what age population does the the three point comes right from but what age range does that include because I think that might be what the difference is yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so it's specific to Jackson County, um, whereas the data um, previously might have been broader, yeah, a broader geographic area. Um, and then, you know, any data, if you cut it different ways, you're going to get uh, differences. So it isn't necessarily an apples to apples definition. <laughs> yes. Um, and I think that one of the, the bigger things we were looking at here was the disparity in unemployment rates. So we, we definitely, whether that number, um, if, if you change the age range, you're likely to still see a disparity between the groups. And, and with, with all data, um, I think that there are absolutely limitations. And so as we looked at this, what we were trying to do is sort of get a general feel for areas of opportunity um, versus uh, sort of pinpointing the exactness of the different data points and, and uh, we have, in the past, spent way too much time in arguing data and comparing data and trying to get to perfect when, at this point, what we wanted to do was get a gestalt and understand the community um, in a general sense. And so um, what we did with this data was spend more time talking about what are the, the implications if we do have disparities here and what are the systems that might not be working um, versus looking at the... Um, individual data points as sort of um, digging into those. And I, you know, we don't have to spend the time um, today going through the data. Um, I think our goal was that we would um, have a conversation about how the county might be interested in using this in, uh, as the county is proceeding with strategic planning efforts. So if okay with you guys, I was going to kind of skip through these um, specific slides with the data results on them. If there, unless there's anything that you want to stop on, yeah. Yeah, on yes, on May, um, page 19 of 24, um, you have 12 percent of middle school students have tried to kill themselves. Mm -hmm. Is that of all schools? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so all the school districts except the alternative schools participate in the MIFI survey, and I'll let Irene correct me if, if um, but the, the survey does have questions asking the students about their 
um, previous attempts, suicide attempts. And so this is a, a piece of data from that. So that's all the middle school students in Jackson County? Pretty much, with the exception of um, the alternative the schools. Alternative schools are not included in that data. And um, all of it is available online. Um, you can look at it at the county level. The schools get um, data individual to their school. Publicly accessible data <laughs> is only um, Jackson County. So if you look up literally MIPHY, M-I-P-H-Y, um, you, can, you can look at all of the data at the county level. So roughly, what's the population of the middle schools of Jackson County? Small park figure. Oh, I don't know. That, um, Probably about 6,000. There's 2,000 students. 6,000? About 6,000 students. Mm -hmm. So you have 720 who thought about or attempted suicide. Mm -hmm. Seems high. Mm -hmm. and do you have an action item that addresses that to try to find out why and how you can prevent that? Because that seems awful high to me. Yeah, yeah and I think, um, so as we look at root causes, a lot of the, the work that we're doing um, the intention is to address multiple outcomes that you're seeing in this data. So for example, um, the trauma that youth are experiencing in their lives and then the, the implications that has for their um, ability to adjust to um, issues or the resiliency later in life if something comes up. If they don't have a store of assets um, that they've built up in their young childhood, then it becomes very difficult for them to deal with things. So those are parts of the um, initiatives that we have going on is um, trauma-informed organizations that understand how to deal with um, children who may not have those assets built up and how to support them. If, if I may, too, to be mm -hmm. clear, it's not have thought about it. This says have tried yeah. to kill themselves. So mm -hmm. it's even more worse than thinking about it. So do you, can you please say again, because to me that seems like a very large number, 10% of our kids you know, have tried to kill themselves. I mean, I, I just think that's horrible. Mm -hmm. And I like to know specifically what ac action items that you have taken or proposed to take to let that number go down. Yeah. Do and does anybody else want to talk more about the trauma um, informed concept? There's a suicide prevention coalition mm -hmm. that I believe is um, worked on through a behavioral health action mm -hmm. team that is working toward that. We're um, at, a, at a county level um, working to train everyone on adverse childhood experiences. And the more that we can learn about uh, preventing adverse childhood experiences, which are child abuse and neglect and domestic violence and um, the types of things that affect <coughs> children at a young age, the more we can learn about that and prevent them, the uh, the more likely we are to affect these kinds of numbers as our children get older. And this is being coordinated through LifeWays, correct? Right. We're part of the mental health. Yeah. So, Doctor, that's why we appointed you to the LifeWays board, sir, so you can help us <laughs> get the solutions that we need. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. Partner. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's probably primarily coordinated through Family Service and Children's Aid and Department of Health and Human Services in terms of ACEs. But I think what's important in the collective, uh, in our Jackson Collaborative Network, is that we are all a team in this. So LifeWays is part of it, the private agencies are part of it, the public agencies are part of it, and we're all working to make change in very concerning data that you'll see throughout this presentation. Yep. Thank you. One thing I would add to that is that um, what we're trying to do, we keep talking about systems level change. So talking about... And can you step up to the microphone, please, because we are broadcasting this. When we're talking about systems level change, we're talking about changing the way our systems, like the education system, the healthcare system, changing how they behave to better serve our residents. So when we're talking about something like trauma or adverse childhood experiences, one of the things that we're doing as a strategy is trying to ensure that as many adults who come in contact with children have been trained in adverse childhood experiences are behaving in a trauma-informed way so that the, the adults in children's lives are behaving differently and are better able to support children who have already had um, difficult, like, adverse childhood experiences. So as they're coming up through these various systems, we as a system are behaving differently to better support them. Thank you. Yes, 
Sorry, just a brief brief question. Um, I, I, I noticed that you said that uh, this data does not include um, the, the alternative schools. Could you just give a, a brief explanation as to why? Yeah, the, so it's a, a state level survey that's administered in different school districts. So the school, school districts agree to have spend the time in the classroom to administer the survey and it's usually a computer based tool. I don't know, do, you, do we have any explanation as to why the alternative schools no. have not adopted no, this? I, I'd sure like to know that. <laughs> Is there someone specific we could ask, Irene? You look like you like, yeah, we wished we had that data, but. It, it's at the discretion of schools, so it, it is something that we are talking about okay. on a regular basis with school superintendents. Yes. Okay, about thank the you. The importance of gathering information from that high risk population. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was concerned about. It seems like with the you know as alarming as this data is, these numbers would probably increase if that population of students had been surveyed as well. Right. That, yes. that is true. Because okay. We also, can, when we look at MyFi data. We also can look at the data specifically for A and B students and the data um, for, for C and D or D and E students. And so, yes, I think we would find the data would be quite different from, for the alternative schools. Thank you so much. Any other questions on the, the data that was shared in the packet? And again, this is just a sampling of the information that we had available and that we reviewed as a collaborative network um, and that our partner agencies are using. And what we were hoping for today is an opportunity to have a dialogue about how we can support the county in um, using the results of our shared community assessment findings. So um, the, the snapshots that we showed in the presentation today and then the full um, data infographics that we have, which we have like on large pieces of paper or on PDFs, um, and how those could be integrated into the county strategic planning process to ensure that as just with, with other uh, community partners who are engaged in this work that as an organization the county is looking at and understanding the um, outcomes that our, our constituents are experiencing. And then just talking about how in the past we have had a great partnership with the county in looking at how what the county has prioritized as a strategic plan fits into the broader uh, community network plans. Um, so that, for example, if we're uh, we if we have 120 community agencies that are working towards certain outcomes and trying to embed certain system changes like the trauma informed training, that we are. Um, the county is aware of those and has the opportunity to say, well, these are certain strategies that we would want to champion or these are system changes that we would want to enact in our um, organizations as well. And that, um, you know, as the county is proceeding with the strategic planning process, any opportunity that we as a network would have to assist in that process or to participate in that process or to um, provide data or feedback that from the activities that we've been conducting with our um, broad network of partners um, that could feed into that process. Did anyone else want to add anything to that, that kind of ask for today? Um, on one of your, your graphs of drug-related deaths, mm -hmm. uh, you have a total of 80 doses per person. Mm -hmm. Uh, for 2017 mm -hmm. is ma mainly from the physicians or from the hospital or other areas? Yeah, so this is based on the overall um, prescribing rate of opioids for the county and then divided by the number of people in the county gets you to 80 doses per person. Um, we don't have the data, although Jackson Health Network works on um, the MAPS data to look at where our high prescribers are and where there are opportunities. Uh, we do have certain work groups that are focused on, um, from a medical perspective, pain management and uh, alternative strategies to opioid prescribing. Um, so that is a piece of it, for sure. Okay. Thank you. So I was just going to ask if there's a way that we could get 
uh, references for some of these numbers we see here. I mean, we've talked about the unemployment rate. We see in one document it's like 3.9 percent. In here it's 9. Uh, yeah. The doc has talked about the suicide rate. Would it be that difficult to give us the references on where these numbers came from? That we No, I have a file that I can send you guys that you could access all that very easily. It's four, that would be four, helpful for four me. sheets on a spreadsheet. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sorry, just one last question. Just in, uh, in reference to um, the the, um, the the same slide the doctor was just talking about, out of that um, 76 uh, drug-related deaths, um, do you know how many of those were actually opioid-related deaths? We or do, do we have, have a breakdown that breakdown that? in our um, drug-related report. So we have a full report just on. Um, issues of substance use in, and outcomes in the community. So we do have that breakdown in that report um, because it's based on, on ER reports and death certificates. Okay. Thank you so much. Could that be forwarded out to the maybe Mike and then Mike can send it to the commissioners? Mm -hmm. And then also just on that same notion, does that data also show where um, in the county that these uh, particular incidents happened? Um, I'm not sure that the there's a heat map in the drug-related deaths. Um, there are, is there, Richard? Yeah, there's a heat map in the latest report. <laughs> <laughs> there is a heat map in the latest report. We've maintained that from year to year. So the first report was 17. We did another one up to 18. So the heat map is in there. But I think what's probably important to point out is that the heat map is showing you where the uh, 911 emergency response calls took place. Yeah. So it, it's, you know, it, they're, they're, they're mapped out on the heat map. So it's not necessarily um, uh, telling us necessarily where people live and reside within the community in terms of where those map locations are. I just want to be clear about what the heat map is. It's where they have overdosed, yes. One more question. Yes. Um, the, uh, on the graph there, between 2015 and 2017 and on, was it that the time that they started adding fentanyl and cofentanyl to the heroin? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's probably a pretty good alignment more, with that. 10,000 more, 10, more times more powerful. Yes. Yes. Okay. What, one more thing. Would the numbers not be skewed for deaths also? Uh, because of the fact that somebody's transported from a residence, goes to Henry Ford Allegiance and passes there, is the death reported as there, or is there some correlation to the call? Because I think there is yeah. with uh, Dr. Maynell's office, but maybe not. Well, if, if, the, if the person is a county resident, it's going to be counted as part of one of our deaths, but the actual location of death isn't something we're mapping. So if they were transported from a township into the hospital, it's not going to show death at the hospital. It's going to show the overdose location as being their residence. That, that's what I think Daniel was getting at, or Darius, were you not, about whether they were out in the remote area or in the city? Is that yeah. what, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Well. Further questions? Again, if you have any further questions, commissioners, please forward them to the county administrator. He will share them with all commissioners then. Is, is it uh, possible for us to discuss from a perspective what, what if, if you guys have any feedback on what we could do to assist with the strategic planning process or how this data or any of our action plans as we're producing them, um, some of the information that you guys are asking about, you know, about what is being done or what are the community members um, partnering? Uh, uh, sure. Um, first, I'd recommend that you provide all your reference material and everything. Send it to me so I can share with the board members. Yep. And then, of course, our next meeting, where they're, which, uh, what's the dates on that, Deborah? 23rd? Yeah. They have been informed, I believe. Invited um, to, Butter. which one was it, the, the meeting they're coming to? April 23rd at 2 o'clock. The 2 o'clock meeting, because there's a meeting also, I think it's 7 that night, right? 6. 6. Yeah. Thank you. But I think uh, I've been communicating encourage you to come with Ms. Well. Butter at the hospital. That will be with our our consultant. Will be there, and taking community input and so forth. But thank you. Okay. Thank you. Further questions? Just for the 
Dragon. Go ahead, Daniel. Um, is it is it possible that we have those infographics that um, that they have posted either um, somewhere on the on, on, in your office to be viewed additionally or? Probably not in my office, <laughs> to be frank. Okay. Uh, um, I haven't seen how large these things are, but. Um, you know, I think uh, at our public meeting, that's where they should probably post them. You know, at our public meeting, uh, where we're going to have the public there, and <coughs> that way they can see them. I was I was speaking more from the perspective, so that the uh, that that the commissioners could have somewhere that they could actually. Did you not view say that uh, you sent that, PDFs that of those posters to the? I did send PDFs of these. Yes. Yeah. So you guys have the PDF version. So so you don't want to hang them anywhere? That's well, what I was asking for. You, you know what my office a, looks like. Where would you recommend we no, hang them? No, I mean, if not, if not your office, Mr. Overton. And I, I meant the floor. Possibly either in the... So possibly even if it, in the break room, I just think that it would be it would be nice to have them hanging somewhere where people could actually view them aside from it being in a file that they may never open. I don't have a problem hanging them up. Uh, I'll find a place for them uh, in the conference room, perhaps. Go on, um, You know, that's not an issue. Uh, I think they're a lot easier probably to see on a PDF file on your computer, and therefore you'd also have the reference material that you'll be able to look up and see. To look at that thing there, uh, well, that's great that it has the data on it, but it has no reference material, so you can't uh, for, use your own judgment for validity or otherwise. There's, In fact, most of these things, when I look at them, I always have a question or two, and you're using your critical thinking hat and you want to go further and deeper and look at the what supports the data. Like when I was looking at this PowerPoint, I, I know Deborah and I were discussing, I had a couple questions about, well, is this the city? Is this the county? Is this a larger regional area? Because it doesn't really say, I assumed it was county, but then knowing the populations and knowing some of the numbers myself after you know, so many years, I'm going, well, something's not right on that. So the reference material, I think, will go a long way. Uh, the I posters the, are limited in that respect. I, I think the the reasoning as to uh, why, um, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, um, why he's asking for it to be hung in the building so that we can make sure that we have, um, I guess, participation and that we're just making a conscious effort to making sure that we, as we're working, as we're doing things, that we have a visual reminder uh, as to what we're doing. Um, to help combat some of these issues. T to me, these are very serious matters that I believe that we as a, a county board need to look at and what are we doing, what system changes can we provide, or even what voice of reason can we uh, offer to um, various uh, arenas uh, in, in the county to be able to help with the with these issues. And so by I feel that if by hanging it up, it continues to remind us uh, of the work that we've been committed to as an elected official. So I don't think, and so, and quite frankly, just to just to be honest, most people, um, uh, this is important information and important data, but most people aren't going to go and download this just to see it. But if we put it somewhere where people, or in a common area where people are, I feel like they're going to look at it. <coughs> they have, we have a better chance of getting the data out where if we can post it versus just say, hey, go to the website and look it up. Well, let's be clear then. So we're not, I thought the suggestion was post it up so commissioners can look at it. I can tell you in my conference room, the public doesn't roll through my floor that often. In fact, most commissioners don't roll through my floor, but maybe sure. once a week. Right. So you, that won't work. If you really, if the goal is for the public to walk by and see this public, and draw an interest, board, it everyone. needs to be somewhere else. Um, how tall are those things? Are they six feet? Four feet. Four feet? Okay, so, you know, we'll look for a better place that's more public for them to see them, maybe in the lobby or something. Yeah, about that's the more or less what I was thinking, just more yeah, yeah, of the yeah. lobby. You know, we have, um, we have those glass on the right and left of the front door. You exactly can put them in there, thinking. they're protected from the elements, the public can exactly stop, anybody thinking. walking by can stop, they'll get a lot more visibility there than they will, you know, on the 6th floor conference room. Okay, all right, we weren't on the same page, thank you for clarifying. Any other commissioner comments? Real brief. Um, and just on that, the same notion that, that I just spoke on, um, we, we've been presented. Um, if you're speaking to the presentation, that's what I'm asking about. Oh, yeah, I'll wait. Then. Okay. We've, are there any other on the presentation? Okay, public comment.
Peter Bournemouth, I'd like to address just a few issues real quickly. One, there's a post here that I look at all the time when I come to this meeting. It's the perfect size to put one of those long things. And the public does come into this room. It is probably the place where they see you most often. And it would be nice to have one right there. Um, I want to also say, with regard to this Jackson Collaborative Network, I saw one of the early um, slides showing poverty. And it divided poverty by race. It showed that 46% of black people in Jackson County are living below the poverty line. I note that there are eight people here representing various facets of this organization. There's not one black person there. I want to return to the issue of Sheriff Rand. I want to point out that the statute under which the county sent these documents to the governor does not change, depending on who the attorney general is or who the governor is in office. Those things that were not included with the county's submission are required by statute, not by the request or will of a government official. It doesn't matter if it's Bill Schuette or Dan Nessel. It doesn't matter if it's Governor Snyder or Governor Whitmer. Those things were required and they were not submitted. That 30 leads, seconds. That leads to a question of why and who was responsible. Thank you. Any other public comment? Any other public comment? Commissioner comments. Commissioner Williams. Yes. Uh, again, I want to say to uh, the county board, let us continue uh, with the work that we've been committed to uh, in, in doing. Um, we've been presented with a lot of information today um, about the, the realities of life uh, for individuals uh, and families uh, that are in our communities. And we've been elected uh, by these communities and making sure and giving them uh, the security that we would look into um, such matters. And so, uh, again, we've been presented with a lot of information today, and I hope that we can put together some type of um, connector uh, that we can have, have some voice of reason to assist um, in this work. Um, I've worked with every uh, arena um, uh, in, in this group, and I know of others uh, that have been here that have shared um, their information and shared uh, their passion in their work. And so I think that it's important for us uh, in in the decisions that we're making, uh, in the work that we do, that we're keeping uh, this data in mind. Um, because in the reality, if we don't take care of these issues and if we don't look into these issues, Jackson County is going to look completely different. Uh, and so we want to make sure that we're, we're looking into that. Um, I know that there was some, uh, uh, just a comment just now uh, just about the uh, African Americans that are not uh, represented uh, today. They're, they may not be represented today, but I can assure you that there are uh, African Americans and people of color that are working um, uh, in this collaborative network, I being one of them, one of many. Uh, and so we want to, uh, so I just did want to address that as well. But let us continue, uh, again, as I said before, to keep in mind um, the reasons why we're even here. You know, we none of us ran just to see our name in lights. We didn't run to um, uh, for, for any fame, fortune, or anything like that, but we ran because we saw something was going wrong and we felt that there's something that we can do uh, to better th these uh, areas in which we live. So let's make sure that we're staying committed uh, to the work uh, that we've signed up to do. Thank you. Any other commissioner comments? Commissioner Bear. Just a question on... Uh documentation that is presented or off, is available to me to review before meetings. I always go through board docs and look up our agenda. I open and I read every supporting document, every document that's in there. And then show up in a meeting, there's different documents. Um, what can be done to make sure that we get the, the current information so that what I'm reviewing Sunday afternoon, Sunday evening is the same stuff that's here Monday morning. Any other commissioner comments? Yes, sir. 
Just to thank you for a presentation from the Jackson Collaborative Network. Any other commissioner comments? I do want to share with everyone that you're, I don't know if people are aware or not, but Ann Barrett passed away on March 28th. Most of you may not recognize that name, but that was Ann DeWire. She was our county guardian for a long, long time and helped train me in knowing what I was supposed to do and not do. So uh, she passed away on the 28th. And uh, just keep her family and everyone in your prayers. Thank you. Commissioner Overton, anything? We are adjourned. <laughs>